Okay, today is November 5th, 2013. This is Forensic Interviewing of Children, and we're going to pick up where we left off, and that was in Learning Unit 5. We were talking about how children experience sexual abuse. What are the psychological dynamics that children go through typically when they're a victim of sexual abuse? And because we're focused on Roland Summit's Child Sexual Abuse Accommodation Syndrome, and later Finkelhor's um, uh, writings as well, which we'll touch upon in a second, our focus is mainly on intrafamilial, abu intrafamilial abuse, caregiver sexual abuse, um, people who abuse kids that have supervisory control over a child. The most common example is a father or stepfather, but it could be a coach or a, um, it could be a um, teacher or it could be someone else who has uh, the authority to discipline a child and a certain amount of legal control over that child. Obviously, a parent is the most compelling example of that. And we looked at Roland Summit's work. I gave you the acronym for when you, um, uh, the mnemonic for when you have to remember what Summit's categories are. She doctor, okay? Those are the broad categories of the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. Secrecy is the first precondition, S H. Helplessness, right? Secrecy, helplessness are the preconditions, SH, uh, she doctor. E is entrapment and accommodation. Uh, D is what you're looking at now on the board, delayed or unconvincing disclosure, and R is retraction or recantation. Just to go over them very quickly again, Summit said S and H, secrecy and helplessness, are preconditions. They are the ingredients, the recipe for intrafamilial sexual molestation or caregiver sexual molestation. Without either of them, you couldn't have intrafamilial or caregiver molestation. Without secrecy, the molester would be exposed. So you need a context which is secret. Family, for example, right? That's a good example of a very private situation where things can go on that the rest of the world doesn't know about. Uh, the gym, uh, the daycare center, the school, where there can be one-on-one -on -one between a supervisory person and a child. So you need secrecy in order for this kind of sexual molest to occur. That's why it's a precondition. And helplessness is the other precondition. Uh, the victim is helpless in this scenario because they are subordinate to the caregiver and they are immature. They're children. Uh, they don't have any control over their own destiny, over their own lives. Uh, they have to do what the caregiver tells them to do. They are, uh, by definition, in a subordinate position. So when you have a, 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 a context that is secret, that the rest of the world can't see, and where you have a victim who has no power or control over their own destiny, you have the recipe um, for child molestation if there's someone so inclined to take advantage of or exploit that child. And when the molestation happens, uh, the child is uh, unlikely to object for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, who they can object to, right? I mean, because they're helpless and because it's secret, no one can see what's going on, they don't have a lot of options. There aren't a lot of people to go to, right? So uh, the child is trapped. Uh, and it happens once, twice, three times. And the recurrence of it also discourages the child from coming forward because uh, they begin to realize, uh, who's going to believe me now? Uh, it happened more than once. They're going to say, I liked it, or I wanted it, or uh, no one's going to believe me because they think that I'm making it up, or I would have told right away. So the fact that they didn't tell right away also weighs heavy on their mind and reduces any options they might have uh, to avoid being molested. Uh, so um, because they have no options, they're trapped. Okay? I mean, they don't realize that they couldn't do anything even if they wanted to. But after a while, because it happens more than once, uh, that is something that the child analyzes and says to themselves, you know, no one's going to trust me or believe me because I didn't tell right away. When if they really thought about it, they had no one to tell in any of that. So you have a secret context, you have a helpless context, and because of that, uh, the molest happens uh, over and over again to the child who has no option. They are truly trapped. Uh, where they have uh, no one to go to, no one to tell. Uh, so they need to figure out ways to survive or cope, as psychologists say, cope. 
uh, we call that accommodation. Uh, they figure out ways to go on living um, despite the abuse. Now, that's accommodation. She doctor, secrecy, helplessness, entrapment, and accommodation, learning to live and cope with the molest in a variety of ways, and children develop a variety of strategies to go on living. Um, but as they grow older, right, the um, foundation begins to crack a bit. Uh, the secrecy and the helplessness begin to dissolve away because children are now growing, they're becoming um, uh, older, uh, they reach the years of adolescence where they have more power. Okay? Remember, we started out by saying they've got no one to run to, they can't hide, uh, they have to listen to everything their parents say, uh, they have no control over their own lives. But as children enter adolescence, they begin to have a little bit more control of their own, over their own lives. But they begin to have some options. Their world begins to expand. And then the foundational prerequisite for the molest begins to show cracks and fissures, and a child may tell now. Okay? They're not as helpless as they were. Okay? As a child gains more and more autonomy, the potential for disclosure becomes more pronounced and more likely. Uh, unfortunately, though, when it does happen, it, it necessarily happens in a delayed way. Delayed means it, it, no, she, she, well, she, she didn't tell after the first time. She told later on, after weeks, months, and most of the time, years have gone by. So, by definition, when you look at the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome, it's always delayed. Okay? So it comes out in a delayed way, obviously, because it wasn't told about... It wasn't told upon the first act of molest. And um, more troubling, it comes out in an unconvincing way, okay? As Dr. Summit writes in the Child Sexual Abuse Accommodation Syndrome article, most ongoing sexual abuse is never disclosed outside the family. And when it does come out, it comes out incrementally, in bits and pieces. I likened that to what last week. I said, sometimes kids will tell you a little bit, they're just doing what? testing the water. That's one reason why it comes out in bits and pieces. Not every kid tests the waters, but that's one reason why it comes out in bits and pieces. Uh, sometimes kids don't want to tell the most damning aspects of what happened, the most horrible aspects of their molestation. One, it might be too traumatic for them. It might be too psychologically difficult for them. And the other reason may be they want to continue protecting who, of all people? The molester. You know, kids know, especially in the teenage years, that if they tell the whole story, he's going to get in a real lot of trouble. And remember, these, these are kids who necessarily are conflicted about telling. Uh, they delay telling sometimes because they don't want to get him in trouble. You know, we say that they're helpless. They are. But another reason was, even if they had the power to tell, uh, they often think about what the consequences of telling are. And the molester may tell them, I told you that last week, you may be put in foster home, uh, your siblings will have no parent, no daddy. You know, brother and sister will have no daddy. I'll go to jail. Mommy won't have any money coming in the house. Now, if the molester doesn't say that directly, kids can infer that. Even little ones can infer or figure out that bad things are going to happen if I tell. To me and to dad. And you know what? Dad ain't such a bad guy after all, you know? Dad does a lot of good things, too. And this is dad or stepdad. This is someone who I know, trust, and love in all other aspects, most of the time, in all other aspects of our relationship. So, you know, it, for me to inform means I have to inform on someone that I love and trust, and I don't want to see them get hurt, as peculiar as that sounds. That's what's happening here. So that doesn't go away when they do tell, or choose to tell, as adolescents many times. Um, they may tell a little bit of it because they don't want to get in big trouble. You know, they want safety. They don't want it to do it to their siblings, okay? They want it exposed. Uh, they don't want to be molested again. Um, but they don't want to see him suffer the most dramatic consequences, which include imprisonment, uh, loss of my relationship, me, the victim, with my siblings, or my mom. You know, I don't want to see the house uh, be taken away. I don't want to see mom crying every day and, and have no money to pay all the bills. So... The child may disclose in bits and pieces just enough so that action's taken, but not enough so that 
the family's destroyed. But you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. It, they, that, that may be the reason, that might be the motivation for incremental disclosure, um, but it's, it's never something within the child's control. The aftermath of uh, disclosure of sexual abuse is beyond the child's control. The issue here, though, is, you know, why are they telling him bits and pieces? That's one, one reason why. One reason why. You know, and, and sometimes it's so pervasive. One thing that's good is it's nice that we're talking about this after reading the Jane Doe piece. Um, but it, it could be so prolific, the molestation, so, so uh, large scale, uh, that you can't tell it all in one city, you know? I mean, you might just tell the highlights of it uh, um, or parts of it um, and um, forget about other parts of it or only tell what, you know, you can get out in one, in one statement, okay? Um, and, you know, kids don't understand the difference between he comes in and sucks on my breasts and puts his fingers inside my body, you know, it, it, it's all bad, you know, and, uh, but under the law, the finger inside is 20 years in prison and the following the breast, much less, and is perceived by many to be less significant when, from a psychological perspective, uh, they're nearly equal in damage that they can cause when it's a father or stepfather or trusted person in the child's life. So they might tell a little bit of it, they might tell the incidents that resonated or important to them and, and not give us the whole story because they don't remember it or they think they're telling us everything, but there are many, many more incidents, some that simply they didn't tell us about the first time because they didn't think of it. Uh, it comes out jagged and incremental and bits and pieces. Um, and sometimes um, it happens in a state of turmoil. I talked to you about the angry teenage girl who uh, uh, explodes uh, in front of her mom and finally lets it out. Not a good time to tell. Uh, not a good time to tell if you want to be believed. Um, uh, when, it, when it arises in a um, state of rebellion. Um, and, you know, very often uh, the child is, is so fractured, um, so, so uh, uh, affected by this ongoing abuse that when they do tell it, uh, their affect, their demeanor, their behavior, the way they're, way they're presenting uh, seems inconsistent with what they're saying. You know, they're not sobbing and crying about the molest. Uh, they might be matter of fact about it. When, they're, when if mom says, sit down, tell me what happened, and, and they're not getting what mom thinks they sh she should be getting, uh, a lot of emotion. Um, it can be often disclosed without any evident feeling or emotion, okay? Uh, there's some of the data for 94, uh, 248 kids who were, as a fact, uh, confirmed sexual abuse cases. Three quarters of them did not disclose within a year of the molest. So kids don't tell right away for all of the reasons we just talked about. So that's the D, she doctor, um, uh, delayed or unconvincing disclosure. And what happens next is critical um, for the child and for the case, if you will. And I mean the case in the sense that the child protection case and the uh, criminal prosecution. What happens next is critical in how that goes, uh, the child protection case and the criminal case. Um, the child protection case is they need to show, child protection, DCP and P needs to show that abuse happened so they can protect this kid and protect his kids' siblings and anybody else. If somehow the, the accused has access to children, maybe mom runs a daycare center like we talked about before, or, or dad has some other access to kids in some way, shape, or form. Well, that's what child protection is all about. But they can't take action to protect kids unless something happened, right? So whether something happened or not arises from the statements of this little girl or big girl, this teenage girl, okay? Um, and it's, it's important that that child be able to express uh, what happened to her in a way that uh, is persuasive uh, to the authorities, whether they be child protection or criminal. Um, and um, similarly, when they do tell criminal, if it's a criminal investigation, uh, that needs to be persuasive as well. And whether it's persuasive, and whether it's consistent, and whether that child um, uh, builds on the disclosure and tells more about what happened in the ensuing weeks right after the kid finally does tell, um, uh, is affected uh, tremendously by how her family reacts 
and her loved ones react. And I say family, the nuclear family and the extended family and the people and grown-ups that surround her. If that child is embraced and believed, then the outcome is a thousand times better. If that child is rejected and called a liar, then uh, the outcome is quite different. Uh, typically, the case begins to fall apart, and child protection uh, may or may not be able to take action, and the criminal law may or may not be able to take action. And in the most severe cases, uh, where the child um, finds her entire world crumbling, uh, where her siblings turn on her, where her aunts and uncles disbelieve her, where her mother is ambivalent or conflicted or outright denying that it ever happened, when that scenario occurs, which uh, is uh, sadly uh, relatively common, you have the last element of Professor Summit's syndrome called um, a retraction. And I went the wrong way. Did I? No. Um, right here. Recantation or retraction. The chaotic aftermath of disclosure, family stress and disbelief, uh, the family begins to disintegrate, people begin to feel guilty about dad's predicament, okay? Disintegration means dad's in jail, representatives of the state government are now in your household, they may put an ECAP worker in your house who's a government subcontractee who might be there for a few days to make sure things are stable. Um, uh, you know, mom uh, may not be working or may be working uh, at a part-time job and is going to experience difficulties making sure the lights stay on and the bills are paid. Um, and um, the very things that the child feared or, in the worst of cases, the molester um, uh, leveraged by telling the child these things would happen, and it will be your fault, happen in fact. And when they begin to happen in fact, and all of the child's greatest fears are realized, um, and she is met with disbelief and a lack of support from the people who, the only people on the planet who could embrace her, they'll take it back. They'll say it never happened, I made it up, or I dreamt it, um, um, or only a little bit of it's true, most of it's untrue. Uh, we call that recantation. And the, the, the goal there for the child is to undo what's been done, uh, to put the lights back on, uh, to reunite dad with the family, to uh, recapture the love of her siblings and aunties and uncles and everybody else. Better that I fall on my sword then all of these people um, suffer. And the way to do that is to say I made it all up. Um, and that's recantation. And that happens, uh, you know, maybe in anywhere from 5% of the cases to 25% of the cases. The, um, you know, the data is all over the place. But we know it happens, and it happens relatively commonly, okay? Here, recantation rates across studies range from 4% to 50%. Recantation rates from 4 to 27 percent in another study. Um, you know, I've been around long enough where I can pick them out with nearly 100 percent accuracy. Not just I'm um, the smartest guy in the room, just because I've been doing it a long time. And it's easy to see because if mom don't believe and his, his siblings are antagonistic, and you can see this in my office the day of, I mean, you can see the family dynamics unfolding, um, uh, they're going to recant. And they're going to recant. And recantations are most likely to occur in those intrafamilial abuse cases where you have the things I talked about. Disbelief, non-supportive parents, blaming, and stressed out people. And the child's going to try to take it all back. And that's the last element of Dr. Summit's, um, uh, Dr. Summit's child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. Now, from a prosecutor's perspective, um, because we know this, we're, we're better able to size up these cases for prosecution. So if the child made a good statement about the abuse and is capable of expressing themselves well, and um, uh, the prosecution felt strong enough to charge in the first place, simply because the child takes it back or says it didn't happen, doesn't result in a dismissal of the case. So that power that the child thought they had is just not there. 
they're not going to be able to repair the family. They're not going to be able to make it all go away um, because it's not going away. Excuse me. And this is a <clears throat> this is a sad aspect of criminal prosecutions where um, the short-term trauma to the child is outweighed by the long-term safety for that child and the other children because uh, most prosecutors move forward even when there's a recantation. And in my career, we've been very successful in prosecuting recantation cases. Um, and in some ways, they're easier to prosecute because the child is not subject to cross-examination. They simply come in and say, I made it all up. And a defense lawyer is not going to challenge that. They're happy that the child said that. So then the emphasis is placed on the child's other statements, not the ones that are made in the courtroom. And fortunately for New Jerseyans, uh, the Supreme Court of New Jersey and the legislature of New Jersey a long time ago had ruled that the video recorded statements of children about abuse may be admissible in court. So the child see, uh, the jury sees the video recorded statement of the child about what happened in the past um, when they are um, uh, reviewing the case uh, to decide guilt or innocence. Um, they'll also see the child come in and say it didn't happen, um, but they also get to see that video recording in most cases. Uh, it's not a substitute for the child, because the child still has to come in and say it didn't happen. Um, but uh, in some ways, the prosecution gets a little bit of an advantage here because we don't have to sit back and worry how the child's going to do on the witness stand. There's nothing to do. Uh, they simply come in and say they made it all up. Um, and then we go forward and we show the video recording and any other evidence we have. Uh, and um, we've been, you know, very, very, my colleagues throughout the state and country, uh, not all states have these very child friendly laws that we do in New Jersey, many do. Um, uh, but uh, we've been very successful around the country, and specifically in my office, in prosecuting these kinds of cases where the child recants. Uh, you're building a very different kind of case in that uh, scenario, though. The focus then is not only about what happened in the past and what the child said about what happened in the past. You know, dad comes in my room, dad did this, dad did that. You need to give that to the jury because that's what the allegations are. But then you need to focus on what happened afterwards. You know, how she was treated by her siblings, all the things I talked about, whether mother believed or not. That's why child protection workers can be very helpful, because they have an ongoing relationship with the mom and the family after the disclosure. You know, if mom refused to take the child to the doctor, then put that in front of the jury. You know, if mom uh, missed appointments to um, uh, get the ECAP worker in the house, you know, put that in front of the jury. Um, what I used to do, and still do in a very different way now, though, um, go straight to the jail, and uh, there's a big book there where they log in. What do you think they log in at the jail uh, when people come to the jail? Visits. So I would get the book and photocopy, and who do I care about is visiting the bad guy, the accused? Mom, right? So if I can pro provide the jury with proof that mom you know, was at the jail three times a week, visiting the molester, and they had a section there she brought, like, snacks and goodies and things, you know. I want the jury to know that. What, what's the child? She missed her medical appointment, right? She missed her appointment with the ECAP worker, but not once did she miss going to the jail bringing dad snacks, right? So that's a rather stark example. It's never that good, but any evidence that the mom visited the accused in the jails is, is, is helpful to show, you know, what, what, whether the mom is supportive or not. I, mean, I need to show that lack of support to then point the arrow to recantation. You want to know, ladies and gentlemen, why there's a recantation? Because after the child told, was she embraced, was she believed? No. And here's concrete evidence of that. The jail records, the missed appointments, telling the, type, telling the diapers worker I don't believe it, and I will never believe it, and he's a good man. You know? Statements like that, you give it to the jury. You show them that this is the reason why the child came in and tried to take it all back. Um, and you present all that to the jury, and now they have uh, at least an understanding of how this could be. They don't have to accept it. They can accept that the child never was molested, and that the statement she made in the courtroom is the true statement, and that she did, in fact, make it all up. But the other thing that we do that can be very helpful is, once we know that the child recanted, we interview the child again. And, you know, we tell the child, listen, I just choose to believe what you told us the other day is the truth. And I know you said it didn't happen. I simply believe that it did happen. And I'm not telling you to change 
you know, what you said or what you're going to say in court or at any other time. If you say it didn't happen, you can keep saying it didn't happen. I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I just want to let you know we believe you. And we believe that when you spoke to Fran or Giselle or Rachel or any of the interviews, we believe that when you told them what happened, that that was what really happened. Okay? And this isn't a traffic ticket, and this isn't a, you know, somebody's uh, uh, dog got loose in someone's yard, and the neighbors can drop the charges. We don't drop charges. You know, we need to go forward. And if you say you made it up, I need to know what the reason is that you made it all up. And that's key, because most of the time, um, the, the reason for making it all up is so disproportionate to the false allegation uh, that it's quite transparent, and the jury and any fact finder can figure it out right away. Especially with the little ones, the seven, and eight, and nine year olds. Dad wouldn't let me ride my bike on a Friday. Uh, you know, I wasn't allowed to um, put my picture on the refrigerator like my brother and sisters were. Or I don't put my toys away. Dad yells at me. You know, the, the, these these uh, acts of parental discipline that are very normal. Um, uh, certainly wouldn't cause a child to fabricate the most sordid uh, um, expressions of sexual molestation that one can imagine. There's just, there's no equal there. They're so disparate um, that the jury can see that this is really a child who's trying to take it all back for the reasons that Dr. Summit wrote about. Um, when you get with teenagers, though, it's, it's more problematic because the teenagers will always, not always, but most of the time will give you this one. You know, I was sleeping with a boy, or I was having sex with a boy, and I didn't want my father to go find out. Or I thought my mom would take me to the doctor and they'd see that I was having sex. That the doctors could tell, because people still believe that, the doctors could tell. I, I, I thought that I would be discovered that I was sleeping with my boyfriend, so I blamed my dad. Because I don't really like, he's a jerk and everything, but he never did that to me. And juries like that. And you get to dump on the victim. You get to show that she's promiscuous and rebellious and wild and all that stuff. And often she's all of those things um, because she's not simply a teenager who all, most teenagers uh, express some degree of rebelliousness in their adolescent years. Um, but one who's been sexually molested throughout her childhood is going to be, um, in most cases, uh, quite rebellious, more than average, uh, and that's not a good witness. <laughs> you know, having an angry, disinterested, uh, rebellious uh, teenager on the witness stand who gives the jury something to hang their hat on for the recantation, you know, it's because my dad caught me sleeping around with boys, and dad's going to come and say, I did, he'll take the stand, I did, I caught her sleeping with boys. Uh, those kind of cases are, are tough to win with teenagers when you have a recantation. The good news is, though, as soon as you get the recantation, you bring that teenage girl in there, she's probably not going to give that one. That's usually sprouts, sprouts out of the mind of the defense lawyers, or usually sprouts out of the mind of the family when they caucus and conference and try to think of a way out of this thing here. You know, um, if you get that child shortly after the recantation, uh, even teenage girls are unlikely to give you, I was sleeping around with boys, as the motivation. Could happen. Uh, but it's less likely to. Um, it's usually under the guidance of the adults that they come up with that defense or that statement. And if anywhere from 4% to 27% of kids recant, the numbers of kids who unrecant, we, we call that affirmation, excuse me, who drop the recantation go up to about 92% once they're told that the case can't be dropped and someone enters their life who's supportive and believes them. If that happens after recantation, nearly 92% of kids who recanted will take away the recantation and say that it really happened. You know, and that's, that's what it's all about in the end. It's about someone believing you and embracing you and caring for you and caring about you. Uh, it, it affects whether these kids continue the recantation or not, right? 
like I said, if they're embraced and someone believes in them, nearly all kids will drop the recantation and tell the truth about what really happened. Same thing in their lives. You say, you know, what happens to these kids? Are, are they destined? You know, you can't, you know, Jane Doe. You, you can't grow up and, and be, um, become a sexual being um, in that kind of an unhealthy way and, and do well as an adult. I mean, that is a recipe for all kinds of uh, sadness in an adult victim's life. Uh, and the question becomes, are the Jane Doe's of the world, are the victims of incest uh, uh, who've been betrayed on such a fundamental level, are they all destined to become, you know, roadkill, to become living on the margins of society, to become uh, someone who uh, is destined to drugs and suicidal ideation and uh, become involved in the sex industry and promiscuous and strippers and, and all that kind of stuff? Are they, are they destined to a life of sadness and uh, unhealthy, intimate relationships? Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> Your personality, these young women, uh, mostly women, but boys are molested as well. Uh, these victims of um, sexual molestation by intimates, uh, by people they know and trust, uh, incest victims, uh, uh, these kids can grow up and be uh, otherwise normal functioning. I talked about KR, in one of my cases uh, from a few years back, does very well doing very well. Look, this is in her, in her history. She has to deal with it. Uh, it affects her uh, every day of her life, but she's able to overcome that. She's able to live an otherwise normal life. You're not predestined to wind up addicted to drugs or in the sex industry or anything else like that. Two important things. Number one is your personality. Uh, you know, your personality is important, and that's something that, you know, you, you got what you got, right? You know, and some kids are strong and grown to strong adults, and they're able to deal with this past and otherwise do well, and, and that's an important factor. But equally important, perhaps most important in every child who's ever been sexually abused life, is whether there's one person, simply one person, that cares for them and embraces them, tells them it's going to be all right, and believes it, and treats them with respect. Okay. One person that they trust who doesn't betray them, if they have that person in their lives, they're probably going to do okay. And they are certainly more likely to do okay than anybody else. So don't read the stories of Jane Doe and other people like her and say, wow, this woman doesn't have a chance. This teenage girl doesn't have a chance. We know where she's going to wind up. That's not true. That's not true. Some of them wind up there because sadly there's no one who cares about them. Um, but if, and it doesn't have to be a relative. Just somebody who embraces them and believes them and that they trust, and this is critical, doesn't betray them. And betrayal lurks around every corner for the incest victim. And that's why they have such a tough time having healthy, intimate relationships as they move forward. Um, because any boyfriend that they have, any man or girlfriend or, or, or intimate relationship they have, even if it's a betrayal that seems insignificant, someone cheated, all right, cheating is people cheat, it's terrible, it shouldn't happen, but it happens, right? Even the most insignificant to most people, act of cheating, um, can have serious consequences if someone who's a victim of incest or um, intrafamilial abuse. And that's why when they grow and develop and they have relationships as an adult, and even those little betrayals um, can be extremely disruptive uh, to the function and to the rest of their lives. And that's why a lot of them do wind up uh, a mess and a bad place. Um, uh, but if you, you know, if you got a strong-willed person and, and there's one person who believes in them and, 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 tr and they can trust that person and embraces them and is in their corner, uh, they can do well, do real well. Same thing in, in, in microcosm, at the, at the trial level. If I'm going to court, if there's one person who believes in that little girl, and it can't just be us, when I say us, it can't be child protection or the prosecutor, you know, or, or the social worker who's assigned the case. That's helpful. 
You know, that's important. But it's got to be someone who's not obligated to do that. If somebody in your life, if you're a victim of incest or familial abuse, who doesn't have to care about you, truly cares about you, you're going to do good. You're going to do good. So it's not as bleak as it could be. This traumagenic model looks at the very same issues that Summit looks at from a very different perspective. Before we do that, does anyone have any questions about She Doctor or the Dr. Summit article? Yes. Well, whatever the child has to say um, about what happened does not influence our analysis of whether something's a false negative or a false positive. The way we do that is to think about what the truth is, right? What what truly happened and what the system has identified as happening. So if the child was truly molested, and the system, by that I mean child protection and law enforcement, if the child was truly molested, but the system, the caring system, for our purposes we'll call it child protection and law enforcement, doesn't believe the child, and concludes that no molest has taken place, that will be a false negative, okay? Because the child was in fact molested, but the system has concluded that nothing happened, a negative, it'd be a false negative. When we miss cases, those are examples of false negatives. When, when, we, when, when a child makes a disclosure, or we see a child doing something in the bedroom, through the window, or we have evidence where it points to the child being molested, and we conclude, when I say we, the systems conclude that the child was molested, when in fact they weren't molested, that would be a false positive. Our conclu the system's conclusion is we've identified some child as being victimized and some perpetrators having doing it, having done it. That would be a positive. And when it's erroneous, when it really didn't happen, that would be a false positive. So what the child says, if they said it happened or it didn't happen, the question is, what's the system's conclusion? And in my county, we're, I'm identifying her as a victim still. So if she was molested, and we do accept it as a true case, then that wouldn't be a false anything. That would be. But if we rejected her, then we would have contributed to another false negative. We would have, you know, back in the day, people came in, they'd go to grand jury, and they'd throw the charges out. When I first started in the office, the case comes in, said it didn't happen, that's the end of the case. So we, in essence, we've created a false negative. A child was molested. So recantation can factor in if you're analyzing it. Kid says it didn't happen, it really did, but they took it back. The system goes, oh, she said it didn't happen, they throw the case out, we've created a false negative. That would be a false negative. If the kid recanted, the system embraced it, or agreed that it, was, it didn't happen. So, and false negatives or false positive is simply comparing what really happened to the system's response. And whether they're identifying it as a true case or a false case. If you identify something as a true case and it didn't happen, it's a false positive false positive, okay? The system said, oh, she was molested when she really wasn't. So someone's falsely accused, false positive. If she was in fact molested and the system doesn't know about it or doesn't agree with her allegation and it really was true, then it would be a false negative. The system declared this a no. If it was a yes, no on the abuse list. Was this kid abused and it really did happen? Yes, that's nothing neither false or negative or positive. Kid was molested. System says, no, she wasn't molested, false negative. Kid wasn't molested, made it all up. System said, she was molested, false positive. Because we're accusing someone of molesting her. It's a false positive allegation. Um, and we're not going to get into too much with that. I, I, the point I, I try to make is we worry, and we should as a system, you know, one of the most famous st statements in all of the laws, better 100 guilty men go free than one man be falsely accused, right? Well, that, that, that means we are a system that um, doesn't care as much about false negatives as we do about false positives. That's what that means. Better 100 guilty men go free, right, than one innocent man be convicted. So, we're worried about the one innocent man being convicted would be a false positive. Okay? And we're more interested in letting 100 guilty people go free than one guy get in trouble for something he didn't do. 
and that's that's the way the American legal culture is, and that's the way our Constitution protects us. Um, but that doesn't mean we should simply uh, accept when kids take it back and, and not investigate these cases thoroughly. Um, and um, and we can't ignore the fact that there are far more cases of tremendous amount more cases of false uh, uh, negatives than they are positives. There's scores of children that don't report, that never get discovered, that were in fact molested that the system doesn't identify or rejects. Professor Finkelhor also looked at this in Finkelhor and Brown in the traumagenic model, okay, and he looks at, uh, they look at um, uh, the process of disclosure and the psychological aspects of it just like Dr. Summit did, and they break it down into some categories that are similar in some ways, excuse me, and different in others. Betrayal, traumatic sexualization, powerlessness, and stigmatization. And they make some of the same observations that Dr. Summit did. The perpetrator is in a position of trust and authority. The child discovers that someone that they depended on, that they care about, that they loved, who takes care of them, caused harm. You know, so they have reactions that are very much like grief. Uh, uh, and they can have um, grief-like reactions and depression over the loss of a trusted figure. Even if that person's there in their lives, that person is lost to them because of the fundamental relationship of the betrayal. And you have higher levels of post-traumatic and dissociative symptoms in kids who go through this. And it can lead to an avoidance of close relationships or to indiscriminate choices. That's kind of what I was talking about before. You know, what happens to, 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 to these kids when they grow up? Well, when they grow up, they, they see, as I suggested earlier, betrayal lurking around every corner. So they don't form close relationships. And when they do, if there's any breach of that trust, in the slightest, it can be significant uh, and sometimes catastrophic to that child's psyche, now adult psyche, um, and their future relationships. And since they can't close, get close to anybody, they don't get close to anybody. So they engage in a series of indiscriminate, uh, uh, superficial relationships. Because if you don't put your heart into it, you know, and you don't get close to someone, you know, it seems trivial, but it's, it is psychologically proven uh, that these things happen and that these kids who now grow into adults, um, uh, in essence, save themselves uh, I can't get hurt if I don't get too close. So, you know, they can tend to be um, very superficial in their choices of intimate partners, um, never uh, uh, truly uh, get close to somebody, and sometimes become uh, promiscuous. Uh, because anything more than promiscuity means they need to get close to someone, and that person means something to them. And once that happens, they are at risk for betrayal again. And you can have um, post-traumatic symptoms in that context, even within a relationship. Uh, post-traumatic means you begin to feel the, the effects of the trauma like it was when dad came in your room. And we, we know by, you know, th th what th that trauma feels like, th what that feeling feels like. Traumatic sexualization, okay? Again, we're looking at what the elements of Finkelhor's model is. Betrayal, traumatic sexualization, um, we just looked at betrayal. This is uh, the inappropriate conditioning of the child's sexual responsiveness. They have problematic beliefs and feelings associated with sexuality as well as dysfunctional arousal patterns that can develop. I talked to some of you off the record here before class began about this young woman, K.R. Well, that's, that was my whole argument to the, to the, to the jury was that these, these, this girl went through traumatic sexualization. And in a nutshell, that means, you know, kids learn about sex and become sexual beings. They become people who have sexual attractions and sexual contact with other people. Um, most of the time in a normal, healthy way. You know, they begin to, in, in early adolescence and adolescence, uh, begin to have a relationship with boys and girls and kiss and touch and explore and get in trouble and not get in trouble. And, grow up and then begin to have feelings and have breakups and then end of the world and we've all been through adolescence and have relationships and, 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 and that's normal. Okay? Uh, it happens incrementally and it happens in a, 
in, in an even-handed way. It happens in a way where the playing field is level, um, where we're dealing with peers and people that are about our age. Um, and that's how you grow up and you become a sexual person. And, and, and these kids uh, doesn't look like that at all, okay? It's unhealthy sexualization. It's, they learn about their parts and how their body responds um, and the, the nuances of human sexual contact in an unhealthy way by someone who is forcing it on them when they don't want it. So the sexualization happens not in an even-handed, give-and-take, uh, boy meets girl, teenagers, hugs, kisses, heavy petting, drinking a beer or two or whatever, pop. However, kids begin to be sexual creatures in 2013. It doesn't happen that way at all. It happens in a traumatic fashion. Um, it happens when somebody forces it on you. Uh, the sex occurs contemporaneous uh, to a traumatic event, to coercion and betrayal. And that's, that's not a healthy way, obviously, to, to learn about human sexuality. Okay? So he calls that, they call that traumatic sexualization. Traumatic sexualization. It happens in a traumatic context to learning about human sexuality. And what's, what's conflicted about it is all, the, the body feels good, too. So it's really uh, uh, chaotic uh, for that child who's molested in that way. Um, you know, I, I, this young woman, K.R., whose case I prosecuted, uh, I was telling some of the other class members who weren't here earlier, she was, my prosecution was about her, her having sexual relations with her father from 19 to 23. By then, uh, she was at, well able to make her own decisions, and she acknowledged that she would look forward to it at times. I mean, that it was, that it was, it was so much part of the way she lived, uh, and the way her body reacted, and the stimulation that she felt, that, that she felt crazed and conflicted and bad about. She knew she had no, no options, but at the same time, she was uh, tremendously confused about how her body was responding. And sometimes she was upset that things didn't turn out the way she wanted them to. Why? Because this was not normal. This, this young lady was sexualized in a traumatic, unhealthy, and skewed way. Okay? And um, they have problematic beliefs and feelings associated with their own sexuality. And that, that I'm describing to you is a dysfunctional arousal pattern. To her to get aroused... And the defense brought out during the prosecution that she would put on a um, lingerie and wait till he got off his shift. Her father was a police officer. And they, you know, I brought in my experts to talk about this, but they, they used that against her, that this was consensual. The whole issue was consent. You know, and I argued this was not consent. It may look like consent, but it's not. It's dysfunctional, and it's wrong, and it's coercive. Um, but, you know, some jurors may have felt that uh, her act of putting on lingerie and waiting for him and not saying no was uh, evidence of her uh, being into it. But when in fact it was clearly a dysfunctional arousal pattern. <clears throat> Here are some examples of traumatic sexualization from <clears throat> Finkelhorn Brown. Sexual preoccupation, repetitive sexual behavior among young child victims, masturbation and compulsive sexual play. Sexual knowledge and interests that are inappropriate to their age. Okay? In the first couple of years when I was prosecuting these cases, we had a few cases that present themselves where the perpetrator... Uh, the accused perpetrator, we were interrogating him, and, and, and the perpetrator says, well, she, she came on to me, and she's seven and a half or eight. She came on to me, and she began to rub my penis, and I couldn't help myself, and I did what I did. Now, as a prosecutor and an investigator and as law enforcement, we didn't care what was on his mind. If he had sexual contact with that seven and a half year old, and he said what I just said, he said, they're happy. We got a confession. Okay? Now, he may be insane for saying that. We don't believe it. And they laugh by the water cooler that this guy, this bad guy, is insane. He said the kid came on to him. But I learned, and eventually they learned rather quickly, that that could be true. If the child was grievously molested. Because these kids 
begin to develop unhealthy sexual sexual preoccupations and un, unhealthy sexual behaviors. Even though they're seven and a half, if between six and seven and a half, their uncle had sexually molested them, you know, they begin to understand at least the sensory aspects of human sexuality, that it feels good. And sometimes they pick up the language of it and the knowledge of it. And they may, they may say things like that. One of the cases, I should print it out, maybe I'll post it in the um, discussion forum, is a case called State versus Budis, B-U-D-I-S. And it was a rape shield statute case. And in New Jersey, the prior history, the prior sexual history of a victim is inadmissible in court, okay, in a rape case or a sexual assault case. Um, involving um, a different person. So I have a case right now where uh, I'll say a um, Trenton State, I'll change the facts a little bit because it's not over the case yet, but a Trenton State sophomore um, was at a bar and she went home with a guy and uh, she woke up unconscious and on the floor with no pants on and, 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 and she had seminal fluid in her vagina. She doesn't remember it, she thinks she's Drug might have been, or drink might have been spiked, and we have, a, sadly, an acquaintance rape case that's all too common on college campuses around the world, including New Jersey. You see 10 or 20 of them a year. We learn, although it's irrelevant, that she's uh, uh, promiscuous. Uh, she's had a number of men that she's picked up, and boyfriends, and had sex with, okay? And that's, that's, that's her business. And the law says it's her business. That prior sexual history, her promiscuity, has nothing to do with whether this guy did what she alleges he did in the night in question. And our laws recognize that since the 1970s. But in the Butis case, we were dealing with, I think it was an eight or nine year old. I'll make her nine, the case is, this was a, someone in grade school age, little girl. And the defendant's statement was, they were watching some video boxing game, and she commented that that boxer looks like he's sucking off the other boxer. This is what the perpetrator in this case said, the one that was under prosecution, State versus Butis. And the perpetrator said, then she began to rub my penis, and she stuck her hand down my pants and was jerking on my penis, and I should have stopped her sooner, but I didn't, but then I stopped her. Nothing else happened. Now, the child said all kinds of sex acts happened, but he gave what we sometimes call a half a loaf. You know, he said, well, it happened, but I didn't mean it. I'm not guilty of anything. That's... You know, so he gave us that, and, you know, the prosecutors, detectives, or the police officers who were involved were, ah, that's so much BS. Come on, man, what eight-year-old does those things, or nine-year-old said those kind of things? Or even, they thought that he made that up completely at the half a loaf. The defense tried to get in the fact that she had been previously sexually abused by another person. I think it might have been her uncle. Because the jury would probably feel, the defense lawyer said, just like the cops felt that this guy's making up a load of BS. Come on, what eight-year-old comes on, rubs his penis, says, oh, baby, does that feel good? That guy looks like he's sucking someone off. Do you want me to suck you off? The, the, the jury said, well, that kid, that's ridiculous that a kid would say such a thing. The defense says, we need to let the jury know that some other guy molested her, and therefore this defense makes sense. It could be true. That was his whole defense, and he had to stick to it. He said that he went and called mom. He goes, I tried to call mom, but she was, I was yelling for her. I don't know where she was. Because the next question was, why didn't, why didn't you tell her mother? And he never told her mother, ever, until he got locked up. And, oh, yeah, I should have told her mother, but I didn't want to get her in trouble. Something like that, he said. The judge ruled rape shield statute. The fact that there was sexual conduct between that child and some other human being at some other time cannot be brought out in this case against this guy. And the prosecution went forward, and he was convicted and sentenced to jail for many years, whatever it was. Went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said there are exceptions to the rape shield statute. And this is an example of what we call an alternate source of knowledge. And the prosecutor, I think it was a woman, I don't know why it sticks in my head, but I mean she, hurt herself by seizing on that in her closing arguments. Had she just let that go, I don't know that it would not have been reversed anyway, but in her closing arguments to the jury, said things like, and do you hear this one that this guy? She says a eight and a half year old came on to her. Is that nonsense or what? 
and that eight and a half year old, seven and a half year old said, you want me to suck you off? What eight and a half year old says things like that? This thing is totally made up. So not only was it in the case um, that the girl said this, but the jury didn't know that she was previously abused, the prosecutor also emphasized that in her closing arguments as evidence that this molester did it and what he said was implausible. It was kooky. The jury wasn't going to buy it for one second. The Supreme Court said, had the jury known that, there could have been an alternate source of knowledge. That's the other thing, too. She knew about human sexuality, the kid. And the prosecutor said, that's because he molested her. That's why she knows what sucking off is. There might have been ejaculation in this case. And we argue that as prosecutors. We say, yeah, how would a child eight and a half know that ejaculation is and that sucking off in this kind of language? Because he molested her. He says, I, I have a right to let the jury know that some other dude taught her his stuff, not me. And he obviously didn't phrase it that way. Um, and the Supreme Court reversed the case and got a new trial. And the reason I'm bringing that all up is that's an example in a crude way of sexual preoccupations, repetitive sexual behavior, sexual knowledge and interest that are inappropriate for her age. The Supreme Court had put their finger on the traumagenic model. And essentially what they're saying is the jury should have known that when kids are sexually abused, they can act that way. They can be sexual beyond their years. And the jury in this case should have known that so that they could put that statement by the defendant in context. That could have been true. His version of what that little girl did could have been true. When you don't know, when the jury doesn't know about that past sexual history, they think it's insane, that argument. Utterly implausible. The guy's a POS and belongs in prison. Makes no sense at all a child would do such a thing. The Supreme Court said they should have heard about that. And essentially, they should have heard that children who are sexualized in an unhealthy way act very differently um, in many cases than other children. They can be preoccupied with sex, they may masturbate, engage in compulsive sex. I'm talking about eight-year-olds have sexual knowledge and interests that are well beyond their years. They also can be confused about sexuality and its relationship to nurturance and power. As they enter adolescence, um, they can have an aversion to sex or the opposite. They can become promiscuous. They can have flashbacks, difficulty with arousal and orgasm, uh, vaginismus. I don't know that word. Someone help me. <laughs> I might read that. Vaginismus sounds. Well, I'm about to look that up. Let me copy and paste. A vaginal tightness causing discomfort. Okay, so the vagina seems like it's closing a little bit here. It's getting tight. I guess it's a physiological reaction. It sounds like we'll have to look at it a little more closely. Yeah, but it, psychological things can manifest themselves physically. I'm thinking here. So, um, but in any event. Um, negative attitudes toward their sexuality, their body, and again, because they learn about and experience sex for the first time or times in an unhealthy, coercive, uh, and traumatic way. Powerlessness. You know, this is like helplessness, right? So we learned about that. Force is not necessary. Kid is in a helpless situation. I'm not going to go back through that, but that powerlessness can continue. That's one thing that we need to be mindful of in the, in the traumagenic model is we looked at helplessness as a precondition for the molest in the Dr. Summit article. Here, you need that power. Finkelhorn and Brown talk about that powerlessness um, as an adjunct to the molest, but it also is something that can define their psychological attitude to sex. Um, into adulthood, and they can develop fear and anxiety symptoms, nightmares, phobias, hypervigilance. In other words, they feel powerless forever. It's kind of like feeling betrayed forever. You can't trust any guys. Every guy's ready to betray you. You know, you can't have a close relationship because they're going to betray you, right? Well, you also feel powerless too. You're, you're, you're always at risk. Clean behavior, hypervigilance, phobias. So this this instills the powerlessness you experience during the molestation inoculates you in a way that it manifests itself 
throughout your life in other contexts other than that molest context with other people, other environments. And, you know, sometimes they compensate for the powerlessness by being over, you know, uh, uh, over controlling and dominating. And another thing Finkel, Hoare, and Brown talk about is this notion of stigmatization. And if you think more about Summit as the psychological aspects of what kids go through as they're being molested, that she doctor, and think about Finkelhorn Brown as going over not only stuff that happens in the child's psyche as it's happening, but things that go on in the survivor of incest's brain years later. Okay? So the sense of powerlessness and betrayal and, and um, uh, these things continue and present themselves in other relationships, in other contexts. That's more of what Brown and Finkelhor are talking about, okay? And this big one of stigmatization. The child, even though they're little, unless they're preschoolers, they, they appreciate, and especially as they get older, that the activity is deviant and taboo. And even if they don't, the molester may declare it as such, either directly or just the way he's treating her, okay, in a, in a humiliating and, and coercive way negative connotations are communicated to the child. Badness, shame, guilt, especially after they disclose and they become incorporated into the child's self-image. Cultural meaning plays a big role. And the molester doesn't have to say it. They can get it from societal cues and just the way we treat people who have indiscriminate sex. Um, it is something that um, can be conveyed to the child either directly or indirectly, and it may, uh, as another uh, example of what I described a moment ago as inoculation. I mean, the kid has this sense of badness, shame, and guilt that sticks with them even through adulthood. And many of these kids are at risk of re victimization. Um, this 2005 study found up to a 75 percent, well, no, that would be a 66 percent re victimization rate. The predictor of being re-victimized is the severity of and child sexual abuse and how severe it was. Um, and, you know, Jane Doe, uh, K.R., girl I talked about earlier today, they all were, even in the world, when I met them in their 30s, were re-victimized boyfriends and men and bosses and you know, and, and part of it had to do with uh, um, the kind of feelings they had that Dr. Finkelhorn and Brown are talking about here. You know, they really don't have it in them to fight it off. They've been taught to surrender to the demands of the man. And overtly, if you were a fly on the wall in some of these other relationships, it, it, the, it, their, their resistance or their response to the demand of the man is really not that obvious. They just submit because they think that that's what they should do. And they find themselves in situations where they're re-victimized. Um, now, this doesn't happen to everybody, okay? Uh, many of them don't do that. Many of them are never re-victimized. But if you look at the universe of people that are re-victimized, that are molested more than once, as adults, you will find nearly 70% of them had a history of child sexual abuse. So, so you say, you say, get that girl from college. I remember her from college. First as a sophomore, she said this kid at a frat party raped her. And then when she was a senior, she said a kid at a, a raid raped her. And then now she's accusing this, the, the bus driver of raping her. All of it may very well be true, okay? And if you get that young lady, and, and now 30-year-old will call her lady in my hypothetical, you're going to find probably a history of child sexual abuse, if those allegations are true, that she was multiply sexually abused. You find an adult who found themselves sexually abused on multiple occasions, you're probably going to find someone who was sexually abused as a child. Because they see themselves, and some, I mean, Finkelhor calls it this, I think, and you guys read the article more recently than me, damaged goods. 
damaged goods. They feel that they're damaged. They're not worthy of respect. Again, not all of them. I mean, I don't, I don't want to paint victims with a broad brush, but many of them have this feeling that somehow they're damaged goods. That's what stigmatization is. They're stigmatized. They don't feel worthy. They feel there's something wrong with them. They deserved it. That what happened to them, people can see and know. Stigmatization. Low self-esteem. So how do they cope? Well, I kind of talked about this a little bit before. I suggested that you don't have to wind up with these things, but many do. Many wind up depressed. They have multiple anxiety disorders. That KR woman I mentioned last class, <coughs> throughout her high school years, she complained of uh, stomach ailments, which she uh, analogized to grinding glass in her belly. Um, and we now know why that was. Um, and um, hyper-anxiety, hyper-anxious, um, chaos and betrayal uh, is around every corner with some of these young people. And, uh, and as they grow older, it lingers. Depression, anxiety disorders, dissociative disorders, um, attachment issues, that's what I'm talking about. You can't get close to anybody, that's an attachment issue. Fears and somatic complaints. Somatic complaints is can't sleep. Wake up every now and then because I heard something. Something scary is around every corner. Why? Because in your nurturing years, in your most formative years, the person who's closest to you in the world, the person God or nature put on this planet to care for you, to love you, to make sure that you're safe, exploited all of that and disregarded every bit of it and had sex with you. Is it any wonder that you wake up, you, you, as an adult, you can't sleep at night? I mean, there's no more fundamental betrayal than, than uh, intrafamilial in, uh, abuse or incest. And so many of these women can't shake it. Sexual behavior problems, generalized behavior problems, and as we mentioned with the damaged goods, self-esteem. Now, I suggested to you earlier that if there's somebody in your life that cares about you, that embraces you, that believes you and never betrays you, you're going to do better. And I believe that. Other predictors of whether you're going to do good or bad are these things. How long you were molested. How frequently. Now, duration could be, you know, my father molested me when I was six once. And um, he molested me again when I was in high school. You know, some guys, they... they they have this deviant sexual arousal, they never act on it. But they mess up once or twice. Okay, messing up is an understatement of colossal proportions, but they do it once or twice. So once when she was, let's say, nine, and again when she was a junior in high school, we would call that a long duration, but not that frequent. Or it could be over the course of a month when she was a freshman, 30 times. So these things, duration and frequency are two different things. They're, often they're related, but two different things. So how long it went on for, how frequently it was, whether it involved force, and of course the intrusiveness or invasiveness of the abuse. Uh, fondling over the clothes versus, you know, vaginal or anal penetration. Uh, obviously the more intrusiveness, the greater the intrusiveness, uh, the research has told us, uh, the more likely victims are going to have um, issues as adults. I mean, all of these things intersect with one another and interact. Other maltreatment, okay, we're looking at the things that could ha that happened to the victim and how they predict a level of functioning as a grown-up. And we looked, you know, we looked at, you know, these four for how long, how many times, whether it was forced, whether it was intrusive, and it's continuing whether you were battered as well. You know, many of these dads, stepdads, are batterers as well. You read the Jane Stowe statement. He was a batterer. He was a bad, bad man. His name was George, by the way, the miscreant that he is. George Baker. I'm going to look him up on the criminal website. George Baker. Not only did he, none of the kids have his surname. 
he battered the mom, he battered the girls, and he sexually molested them. So when you have other maltreatment, you're going to have more likely, a greater likelihood of adult um, issues and problems. The kind of things that we looked at right here. Depression, anxiety, you know, will these things happen? The somatic complaints, all that stuff. Well, they could, depending upon this stuff, how much of this happens, whether the guy battered. And I'm telling you that these things I highlighted can go a long way, a long way to minimizing the adult um, impact of childhood abuse. Support from partners and friends in adulthood and maternal support in childhood, okay? One thing that was different from Jane Doe and KR, right? KR was the case I was telling you about that she was an adult between 19 and 23 and I had to prove that she wasn't giving meaningful consent because her father had terrorized her and her mother and her sister throughout their childhood. KR's mother, once it came out, embraced her and threw him out of the house and filed a divorce complaint within days. Very rare that I've seen that happen in my career. And that can contribute to a good outcome and may explain in part why KR is doing real well and so is her sister WR. Or W. WR. She got married well, but her last initials are. And now, the Jane Doe family, they're doing good too. Moms, you know, they don't blame mom, okay? They just don't. And they realize that mom was just one of them. So they don't blame her, and they don't feel a lack of support for mom. Would it be better if mom completely embraced them, like Gary's mom? Yeah, perhaps. One thing that happened in Jane Doe's case, uh, that didn't happen in Jane Doe's case, was mom rejecting them. She did in the beginning, and all throughout this, there were many things she could have done differently. You read that. Uh, but once it was out in the open, um, uh, she didn't work at cross-purposes with her kids. Sadly, many moms do. They just embrace the father and do everything they can to, to bury the child. When that happens, you're more likely to get all those things we're looking at. Support is real powerful. We're not going to look at this stuff because I'm not going to ask you about this, what the victim response to the abuse is. They, the psychological aspects of um, sexual abuse can also be looked at through the lens of how the victim sees herself. And that's what those other slides were that I flew through that I'm not going to go over. But, you know, sometimes the victim sees themselves as being exploited and, and, and coerced. Sometimes they see themselves as a companion, more like a sibling to the actor or a mother to the actor or a lover. You know, they gotta, they got to make this make sense. They may be helpful to the, the molester. They may make sure he's okay. If he comes home late from work. They, they take an interest in him. They, it's distorted. And there's a number of those things that I'm not really going to go over. We don't need to even know for this class here. But that's what those slides were about. It's analogous to being a friend. It's analogous to being a sibling. Um, you know, they adopt these psychological roles. They become the caretaker for the abuse and sometimes. Sometimes they see themselves as the lover. And, that, and that's taking this distorted sexual molest as a child and putting it into an adult relationship framework just to understand it better. That's what these slides are about. Now, this is what it was like to be an incest victim. This is Jane Doe. You, that's why I had you read that and, and, and tie in what happened to Jane Doe in Tzfinkel Horan Brown at the summit, okay? She's really telling the story of what it was like, what it was like to be an incest victim. Um, and, you know, the, you may say, well, what's Del Russo? You know, he's a lawyer, <laughs> prosecutor, battling away like some psychologist here. And, you know, in order to successfully interview a child and investigate crimes on children, you have to have an appreciation of all of the psychological, social, um, legal, um, um, and medical dynamics of what happens to these kids, right? If you're going to interview that, you have to understand a little bit about the science of child molestation, the medical aspects of child molestation, the psychological aspects 
child molestation, certainly the legal aspects of child molestation. Um, this all matters if you're going to be a forensic interviewer, because the person who's sitting across from you is Jane Doe, okay? And Jane Doe doesn't think like anybody in this classroom. She doesn't think about it like anybody in this classroom at 35 years old. And when we're sitting across from her and asking her questions about the things she did when she was 5 and 6, or 7 and 8, or 13 and 14, we cannot parallel ourselves, because our lives are fundamentally different from Jane Doe's life. And Jane Doe is a, a placeholder. Jane Doe is a metaphor for all of the incest victims. Okay. I don't mean Jane Doe specifically, I mean every Jane Doe. Every Jane Doe that you interview, if you're a forensic interviewer, every one of them is going to be very different from you, and very different as a developing person from the way we develop. Okay. And if you don't know that, you're not in a good position to understand her behaviors and to ask her the right kinds of questions. This is all about sitting down, this course is about sitting down in an interview room across from some other person and finding out about their life, specifically their life, um, when they were sexually molested. And we need to think like they think for a little while so we can ask the right kinds of questions and draw the right inferences. You know? yeah. Investigative interviewing is about drawing inferences. If uh, some child says they did a particular thing, we, we draw an inference about, well, why would somebody uh, climb up the step ladder or go into the attic? Uh, you know, if they didn't want to be abused again. You know, we, 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 we would judge how we would react, but that's not the way they react. Why would someone put on a lingerie, you know, if they didn't want to have sexual contact with their father. That's true. It doesn't make any sense to us. But in order to ask questions and draw the right kinds of inferences and the right kinds of conclusions and ask the right next questions, we got to think a little bit like they think. And we have to understand their perspective. And their perspective is radically different from the average person's perspective who's never been sexually molested. Um, they, they do things that seem illogical to us. But if you put them yourself in their shoes, they're quite logical. Okay? And if you think about Jane Doe and you look at that statement that she made again after our discussion this afternoon, um, uh, you might be able to understand a lot of the things she did a little bit better. You know, I mean, she had an aversion to milk. She could hold her urine in. She was the uh, uh, high in the bathtub. She going to upper bunk, I think. She did everything in her power to avoid him. Uh, that's accommodation. There were so many incidents, I hope you guys hit on. There were so many incidents of accommodation in that narrative. So the reason why we're going over Finkelhorn, and there's much, much research here. This is the landmark stuff. There are thousands of articles that build upon these pioneers. Finkelhorn Brown and Summit. They are pioneers in the psychology of sexual molestation. And interestingly, it's only from 1983. What the hell did we do in the 70s and the 60s? Nothing. These cases were relegated to the family courts. Okay. Generation upon generation upon generation upon generation of female children in our country, and male children, but mostly female children, were sexually molested year after year, decade after decade, until about the late 1970s or early 1980s. Before we began prosecuting these cases as the criminal acts that they are, the good news is is that we're learning more and more. And the next generation of prosecutors, and the next generation of social workers, and the next generation of forensic interviewers will be that much more informed about how to help these people and and avoid the kinds of um, outcomes uh, that the Jane Doe's and the, and the KRs and these other young women. Uh, have to, had to endure. This is from Corner House. Someday, maybe, there will exist a well-informed, well-considered, and yet fervent public conviction that the most deadly of all possible sins is the mutilation of a child's spirit. And, you know, the point there is what Finkelhorn Brown described is the mutilation of a child's spirit. And 
if I gave you one thing, it's a remedy to that. If you know someone like that, you know, be a friend to them, you know. Embrace them. And they'd be more likely to, and understand them. And they'd be more likely to, to do well in life rather than wind up in the gutter. Anyway, that's this, experiencing uh, how kids experience abuse. Uh, learning at five, and the point was so that we have the perspective of the people that we're interviewing, which is quite different from the perspective of everybody else. Next week, we're going to talk about diversity issues in the interview process. Okay, that's a one-weeker uh, lecture about that. My entire lecture is reproduced in the PowerPoint that you can watch. It's, a, it's I don't know, 20 minutes. Uh, but we'll talk about it in, more, in a more in-depth way. And because, again, the more we know about the person we're interviewing, the better equipped we are to do a good interview. Day one, I said to you, we want to learn how to get the most information and the highest quality information. That's all forensic interviewing is. We need to get as much information as we can from our kids and our adults, our victims, as we can, and the highest quality information. Just because we get a lot, it's got to be good information, persuasive information, believable information, understandable information. So this course is about getting the most information and the highest quality information. And understanding the psychological dynamics is a big step in learning how to do that. Also understanding their belief systems, and that what's next, that's what next week's about. Understanding the belief systems that these children grew up in. Okay? So you may have one Jane Doe in front of you who grew up in an Italian household and a Jane Doe that grew up in a in an Ethiopian household and a Jane Doe that grew up in an Australian household, you got three different Jane Doe's. Okay? Three different Jane Doe's. We need to be respectful of and appreciative of that culture's um, beliefs about human sexuality, about parenting, okay, about um, child rearing, and that's why you're going to do your next assignment. You're going to get a little insight into the varying belief systems uh, that people have. And they may surprise you. They may surprise you. Any questions about anything else? Anything we talked about? Then I'll see you here. Yes. Question. Yes. Yeah, thank you. To the next project, yes, we have to interview uh, that is based on the reading that we have for our unit number six. That is no, there's a grid. You have to go into learning whatever that uh, learning project three. If you click on it, it tells you what to do. You want me to bring it? Okay, you have to log on. Okay, right now I want you to log on. Okay, okay. right here. And maybe you can help her log on. Do me a favor because you seem you, you're having trouble there. You're it's not your fault, but you're the only one. Every day. so let's find out what what's going on um, because the stuff's there. There's a there's a, a bunch of questions that you got to ask. And there's a grid, there's a sheet. There's an interview chart. See, when you, when you, there's a chart there, and there's a bunch of questions you have to ask, and then there's a worksheet. At what age is it okay to leave a child alone? Is it okay to spank a child? If you spank a child, where on your body? And um, so you have to dig into there. And then there's a worksheet, too. Yeah, well, it's not going to work here. You've got to do it on your home computer. Some of these things won't open here. No, I tried my home computer, and I got the same. Yeah, well, that's, there's no reason why it's access denied. Yeah, Here it is. Well, that has something to do with your computer settings. I, I, I can't change that. You, there's no reason why you can't open a Word document. I mean, these are very simple documents. Here's the worksheet. Um, but uh, I'll post it in the announcement page, too. I'll put them there. And, oh. 
it's the same thing though. It should matter, but maybe there's a reason why. Um, so remind me this week, uh, Sarah, and you guys remind me, and I'll post it in the announcements. But this is the sheet here. I opened it right from Blackboard. Sometimes it depends on your work program too. Um, on my, my laptop, I can't open it, but if I use my home computer, I can open it on the So I think it depends on. Well, these documents are in 1997 version, though, so it's not like I put them up there. If you have a computer that's okay. 10 years old, it, the word, the version of Word may not open it, but I try not to put it in that version. This is, um, let's see. Oh, these, these are PDFs anyway. It should open that too. You got. Okay. at the end of learning unit yes, seven. Yes, yes. It says now. Learning unit, that's due at 12-2, but then you're going to have the movie to watch in one week, so I wouldn't wait until 12-2. got a month. I would do it in a week. Yeah. But it's 12-2. Yeah, no, that was not your fault. I had to change them. What I'll do is, uh, they're moving to Blackboard's gone. Next year they're using Canvas, a different system. But I'll post the um, the things you need for learning project three. I'll put them in the announcement field. It'll be, you know, so you can either click on them or right click on them and save as. Okay.